Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of A Piece of Ash. This is my weekly show where we sit down, we talk wargaming, I take questions from uh, my patrons and the community and all kinds of stuff, um, as well as from the mailbag and the chat as you guys watch live. Now today's my patron uh, episode, so you guys who are watching it in the future, you're not watching it live, um, this is where I sit and chat with my patrons and I'll take questions from friends and um, sort of like, I guess, uh, other luminaries. Um, so today's question actually, uh, an editorial, is actually brought to you by Joseph McCullough, who's the author of Frostgrave. Um, he dropped me an email this week to talk about, uh, I guess, we're <laughs> in the tagline I call it getting too big. The term he used is too supported. Um, and I think it's important to define, I think, where his brain was at. Because I don't think either of those terms really actually encompass the whole thing. The whole of what too big means. I use too big because it's just an easy way of describing it, but um, it, he used to support it. And I think what we're really talking about is um, when games become ponderous. I think ponderous is the best sort of adjective I could use uh, to describe what that means. And when I say ponderous, what I'm talking about is too heavy for their own good. Um, so you can see examples on the, on the tag screens there. I have the cover of the War Machine Mark II book, and I have the cover of the 7th edition 40K book. Um, and they're good examples of when games have grown a great deal. They've been around for a while, their development cycle has gone on for a long time, and the effect that we're talking about here is when a game becomes heavier, basically, than it was initially intended to be, usually because mechanics or additions or rules have been bolted onto it over time so that it doesn't even necessarily repre like represent or, or, or is recognizable as the original game that it was. Um, this can be done through FAQs, through online living and rule books, um, or just various things that require you to have more than just the original document to play the game or even to recognize how someone else is playing the game. Um, and that's an important distinction is you might be playing the game out of the rule book and one other book, but the opponent that you have might be more up to date than you and have 25 different rule books with rules you don't recognize or changes you don't recognize. Um, and the reason this popped into his head is a concern is he's a game designer. And so it, he thought it was something worth talking about, um, which is the, the net effect of of that, of time basically versus a product or a game that you're talking about here. Uh, and it does eventually have some effects. I'm not gonna say they're negative, because for some people, a vast library of rules and differences, and actually keeping up with that is their hobby. There are people out there who enjoy wargaming um, from a collecting information point of view, not even necessarily from a playing it point of view. They like understanding and having the whole picture of the game in their heads. You'll typically see these people haunt the rules forums of certain um, companies. They like to get involved with community development. They like to get involved with um, things like unofficial FAQs. Uh, and there's a big there's a big lot of this online where it's almost a hobby in and of itself for bigger, larger game systems for people to feel like they are experts in that field and to be the people that answer the questions on those rules and understand the intent or understand better modifications for that. I would almost say that the Ninth Age, which was a initially a rewrite of 8th edition Fantasy Battle after 8th edition went away and Age of Sigmar came around, was almost a collection of those people who had an idea, a picture in their head of what they wanted the next edition of the game to be and they went and they created that and it was a huge endeavor. Those guys went and made um, a, a really vast like effort to try and create their vision of that game and I would say they're probably populated a lot by those people who their their love actually was of, of understanding and sort of like being able to holistically appreciate the mechanics of a game. But as, as, as those people may approach it, I would firmly believe that they're probably fewer in number uh, than the people who might actually be not put off by, but actually be unable to, or, or even just uncomfortable by having to keep up with that amount of stuff, or because they're not sort of like driven to or want to keep up with that amount of stuff, be landed in an uncomfortable situation where they don't enjoy the game because of basically connecting with someone who has a, a broader version of the game in their head than they do. So I'll give you an example. In the seventh edition of 40K, just kind of like explain what that means. One of the things that, that began to grow the game and escalate the game to the, the time where you needed tons of books and even data slates and online things to have a whole vision of the game was formations, was understanding what was a legal army and what wasn't. And I personally became unable to recognize armies at all as being legal or not in 40K because they were typically built of these formations that had nothing to do with the battle forged 
you know, combined arms attachment. And you had these collections of models on the table that unless you were completely well-versed basically in every formation in the game, you might not recognize A, what benefit there was from it. So you wouldn't know what, what they were doing, like what kind of extra rules those guys might get from having those formations, or B, even how it was legal. And there was a couple of times actually in some fairly major tournaments where that became a real impediment to them even doing army composition and trying to trying to make sure that army lists were checked and valid was that there was this huge amount of information out of there that combined all kinds of different ways to try and figure out how people were even constructing armies. So that can be an off-putting experience. That can be a, a, an avert, a, it can avert you from wanting to be participating in a game when you are no longer able to comprehend or understand the amount of information in, in front of you. That there, there's this huge, vast library basically of things that can now be legal. And worse still, to have it codified all in front of you, you might have to have five or 10 or 15 books dragged to a game every single time. Um, and so what I think that does, the net effect of that, is to use a word, it, 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 to sort of like ponderous to try and define it, is it makes a game less approachable. So it, it can be harder from the outside to want to get into it. I think that's also a very good case um, when we talk about War Machine Mark II towards the end, with all the theme forces that were in existence, and just the amount of releases that had happened between Mark I and Mark II, the beginning of Mark II and the end of Mark II, if you were just starting the game for the first time, there was a ton of stuff out there you wouldn't know what it does. And in a game like War Machine, it's almost more important that you know what your opponent's capable of doing as you plan your turn and play your turn than it is what you're capable of doing. And that can be a vast amount of information because there are so many releases and so many units in every army. Um, and when the game comes down to trying to, to get your opponent into an unfavorable position, the more information that the player, the new player who's approaching the game for the first time has to absorb, the more likely they are to get caught in a gotcha moment where they don't know what they're getting into, they don't know what something in front of them does, and they have an adverse play experience from doing it. And so that can be the thing that happens when games get too big, is you have these knock-on effects. Um, now, why do games get too big? I think it's important to discuss too, is typically when you are adding something to a game, you're trying to stimulate the enjoyment of the people playing it, get new people to play it, and drive purchases. You want to sell something when you add to a game. Whether it's the book that adds to that game, so like you might have new rules in a book, the unit or the models with the rules attached to them that you're trying to sell, whatever it is, typically the growth, that's where that word support that Joe used initially came from, I think is a company is trying to support its game by giving people more things to do with it. And it's interesting because there's, there's lots of ways of doing that. In a game design terms, there can be going wider and going deeper. So going wider typically means offering a, a bigger variety of things to do. Um, whether that's adding armies to a game, adding scenarios or campaigns, new ways of playing with your miniatures, things like Shadow War Armageddon was a great example of going wider with Warhammer 40,000, trying to give people a new way to play with models they already owned. Um, or um, you know, you've, you've got Shadespire where you have this self-contained game but it has miniatures in it that you can use in their other game. So that one's almost safe because they're adding to Age of Sigmar with these, these new units as they release the Warbands, but they're also adding to another game. So they're, they're going wider with their product line, but at the same time, it kind of insulates them a little bit because they're not adding too much stuff to Age of Sigmar. They are adding, however, lots of stuff as they go to, to Shadespire. So these are kind of an interesting thing because you, companies have to manage, I think, how they do that responsibly. Um, and that's where the game designer, I think, really has to think, what am I doing? In, in any case, when I'm creating something new for a game, what am I doing? How am I, how am I going and adding to this game? Because the second half of that, instead of going wider, is going deeper. And that's adding something to an existing game. Whether it's a core mechanic that might change, adding something new that is a core mechanic. So now what you've done is you've created an added layer to a game. For instance, um, when they did the Apocalypse add-on to Warhammer 40,000, where they just started allowing you to use super heavy vehicles and knights and stuff that was only typically used in Apocalypse games up to that point in 7th edition into the regular army list, that changed the game. That became a book that you had to own if you wanted all the core mechanics for the game so that you could then add these things to your armies and, and sort of compete at that level where you had these big giant things. Um, you're adding something to the core mechanics of the game. And going deeper into that way into a game system, you can do it for a while, but if you do it for five or 10 years, uh, adding new units, adding new core mechanics, you can tend to inflate the amount of information required to play your game. And so you have to be very careful as you do that over time Am I creating, so if I'm creating a product, am I creating something that every single one of my customers has to buy? Because that can be good, because they might have to all go out and buy it. But if I do that too many times, what happens is 
I'm now creating a scenario where if you want to start playing this game from the very beginning and you want to have everything you need to play, that pile of initial purchases is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, maybe a little bit more off-putting, and to use that word I used earlier, unapproachable. So it can be very interesting, and, and there are ways of safely, I think, going deeper into a game. And typically the safest way to go deeply into a, a single like, product line or game is to add new ways to play that game with what people already have. So things like campaigns. Um, Dungeons and Dragons has it almost perfected with campaign modules, right? Where you have an adventure, you have a story that you go and tell from start to finish. And what you're doing is you're giving your customers a reason to A, purchase something, they'll purchase that, that product line or that product that, that tells in that story. Um, and then B, you give them a reason to pull out everything they have, dust it off, and play a game with it. They get some more enjoyment from it, which might lead to all kinds of things. They want to add a new unit, they want to add something that's already on the shelf behind them, and they go and get to play with. So that's, that's a really sort of, I guess, responsible way of doing it, is to just stimulate the enjoyment of what people do. A lot of companies do that through tournaments, organized play documents. Um, I think Corvus Belly's been doing it very interestingly with their ICS seasons. So every season, the story for Infinity advances a little bit. The current season is Treason, um, where the events of the last worldwide campaign have had knock-on effects for the, the various factions inside of Infinity. There's unique army lists in the, in the ITS document that allow you to mix units you couldn't normally mix before. There's a whole new character, a human that's basically uh, gone rogue and joined the evolved intelligence and, and become a hacking um, sort of like super spy with her little robot. She's reprogrammed and stuck into a, 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 a sort of like combined army style drone which is super cool. She's, she's just renounced her lo loyalty to the human sphere because they're all being duped by the AI and by Aleph. Um, and, and so without having to change the core mechanics of the game, what you're doing is you're giving people a new reason to play. So the ITS document has new scenarios in it, it has new add-on rules that are just for use in those scenarios for things like tags, but it doesn't mess with the core mechanics of the game. All that stuff stays the same. It just gives you new and fun and interesting things to do with the models you already own. And so for me personally, to anecdotalize, what that's done is it's made me go and paint new models, it's made me you know, paint stuff I already have, look at buying new models out of my armies for the season, and it's a way of sort of like driving forward the way the game works. I think Project Breast did it really well too with the new Steamroller, where they balanced out sort of the need to take certain things. So where Warjacks in the beginning of Mark III were very important to the game, now they've gone and added in the requirements for things like solos and warcasters and infantry to score zones, it makes you, again, dust off models that you didn't think you needed. And so they're supporting their game, but they're supporting their game in a way. It's, one, it's free. It's great. These organized play documents are just online for free. Um, but two, it encourages that further support and development of, um, of their community through buying things, getting them to play more games, having the reason I'll get together and do something. But at the same time, it doesn't monkey with the core mechanics and bloat or make ponderous the game itself. You don't require more stuff, basically, and it's not necessarily going to be off-putting for people to go and do it. Um, now, how do you get around this? If you find that your game has become ponderous, if you think your game has become too big, well, the traditional way of getting around it, and I've already said it, is it, it, the fact that there is a Mark III War Machine, um, and that there is a, uh, you know, and we know there's an 8th edition of 40K, is you reset the edition. You start from scratch. Now, I think certain companies can get away with that, and certain companies can't. If you're very new and your games become very ponderous very fast, you might not have to, you might not be able to do that. You might not be willing to have people go out and buy a second edition rulebook really early on. Um, I can think of one company that did it very, very, very quickly, but wisely they made that second edition rulebook really f free, and they've done that ever since then. That's Guild Ball. It was in the first year, almost, of it being out, we were into the second edition of the game. I remember we picked up cards, we picked up our, our first teams for Guild Ball right in season one, and the cards we were playing with or packed in the thing were already out of date when we started playing the game in season one. And it was, it was crazy how fast the game was moving and evolving. Um, and that, can, that even in of itself, like to change editions like that can be jarring and off-putting. Um, but they did it, I think, in a very measured, calculated way where they realized there were some things they wanted to change about their game, and they addressed it really quickly, but they did it in such a way that it was free and it was online and it was, you could just, you didn't, you didn't need to buy more things to, to, get, to get to play the game. They were just like, ah, oh, we don't like this. Here you go, have all this stuff for free. And we'll just put it online. Um, but in addition change the typical way to do it is you just reset the, you just hit the, the end button and you reset the whole thing and you set a new core rule book. And the, the risk in doing that, of course, and the reason why it can only really be certain companies I think that are a certain size and age or after a certain amount of time you can do it is, you typically invalidate a bunch of purchases. People have paid money for stuff and it's sitting there on their shelf and it's not 
it's not valid anymore. They have, I mean, the, the story and stuff might be in it, but they have something they're probably never going to open again to play a game with. And that can be, again, an off-putting and kind of dangerous exercise to do as a gaming company. So you have to be very I think, conscientious when you do it. Um, and so there it is. There's my editorial on what happens when games get too big and what some of the companies do to, to get around it. So I think this is worth discussing if you want to discuss it in the chat. Of course, patrons jump in. Um, I'm going to jump into the mailbag now. Uh, big thanks to Joe for the, the, the question. It was very... It was great. We actually talked about it over email a little bit, so probably he's heard a bunch of what I just said already. Um, but uh, but maybe there was something in there that he that we didn't talk about already and that was useful. Um, but I think it's a good topic. Is that we've got a uh, we've got a, a, a an interesting topic that I think is is interesting even more so because it's something that a real life game designer is now thinking about, and I think you guys can take some solace in that. Maybe there's another game designer listening at some point in the future that actually thinks about this as well because. It is an interesting thing to do. Um, so yeah, let's jump into the mailbag and get some questions and also sound off in the chat so I know who's here. I know Anthony Lee's here, but I haven't heard anybody else chatting yet, so let's see who else is talking. So let's do our first question from the mailbag. We've got Tranius227. Uh, his question is, do you think all the Primarchs will be released or will some be left out because they are more valuable to Games Workshop for the mystery component? Um, if you've watched my show before, you probably know how I feel about what I used to call the Swiss cheese in game design, <laughs> um, or even in just universe building and world building. So, you one of the most one of the most hated uh, properties, or I guess uh, add additions to a property in history, um, panned by fans and critics alike, and loved by some. Everyone's got there's always corner case of people that liked it and stuff. Um, would be the prequel trilogy to Star Wars, the original Star Wars. Um, and the reason that it's so panned is that it attempts to explain everything. Uh, and I think that one of the wonders of um, science fiction and fantasy and world building is that you have these incidental things that people latch onto and gravitate to and want to know more about. And one of the most famous in history is Boba Fett. Boba Fett in Star Wars is just this guy in a mask. He has like seven or eight lines in the entire course of the original trilogy and he dies eaten by a giant mouth in the sand. <laughs> but people have obsessed over him from the time he, the original movie launched till then, just because he had a fantastic costume design, he's very menacing, um, and he was just this cool, cool as can be bounty hunter. And so that little bit there, we don't know about this guy, he's this man of mystery, this dark bounty hunter working for Darth Vader, hunting down Han Solo, working for Boba Fett. It spawned a whole imagination in people. People wanted to know more about him and they created stories about him. And there was novels from the, the novels later on, comic books about Boba Fett. He was one of the most iconic and famous characters in Star Wars with a screen time of under 15 minutes. He, it, 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 it's, it, I think it's proof positive that throw, what some people might think of as throwaway characters and throwaway lines or little bits and pieces in a story can become the thing that inspire people to ponder and think about your property. And that's what makes a property enduring and last. And in a creative hobby like Wargaming, where what you're doing is you're projecting your imagination onto the table and then watching it move around and do things. That is the whole of the activity um, of, of, of Wargaming, is you are, you are actually trying to project your vision of what this little war is in front of you on the table. Um, I think there's nothing more valuable in world building for that than to, to pique the imagination, but then lend pe let people run with it. Uh, in the 40K uh, background, it's the endless debate about the two missing legions. They will never fill in, if they ever, okay, I, I will completely lose faith in Games Workshop's design team the minute they ever fill in those two topics. It, it, because they are so valuable in the mystery and the shroud that they throw than they are in any other way. So I, I, I tell you right now, they, 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 that would be the moment the design philosophy lost its way because it'll have forgotten the value of mystery, especially in a product line that revolves around your customer being inspired to fill in the blanks with their imagination. And so when it comes to Primarchs, I think that there's some value in piecing out certain Primarchs, the demon Primarchs in particular, they're still around, they're demons now, they've, they've ascended to demon princedom, they're never going away, you can kill them off and have them come back a million times, um, forever and ever and ever. The loyal Primarchs, well it's a bit more risky because you have to have a reason for them to come back, you have to have some kind of, I guess sort of like, uh, MacGuffin would be the term, if you guys don't know what MacGuffin means, it means kind of a made up excuse for something to happen. Um, one of the best MacGuffins ever is uh, 
the uh, the MacGuffin at the beginning of the Lego Batman movie, where there's two guys flying the MacGuffin Airlines airplane that's just full of bombs for no reason, and it's it's fantastic. It's almost like a lesson what MacGuffins are. This like MacGuffin Airlines moment at the beginning of the back end Batman movie, and of course because it's a kids movie, it's gonna go right over every kid's head, and actually probably most over most people's heads that it's called MacGuffin Airlines. Um, but it's so well telegraphed and tongue in cheek that it's it's great. So I think it's harder a little bit for the loyal to primers to come back because again you have to have a MacGuffin. Um, Robert Gilman had one built in because he's on the he's on the throne. He was in stasis. He had the cut in his neck and all that stuff. Um, you've got kind of one built in for Azrael because Azrael is. Um, it, you know, there's a guy in the rock and he's locked up and everyone thinks he's Luther and <laughs> there's, a, there's maybe a reason for Azrael to come back. You've got the, the, the lone hunt that, um, that uh, what's his name, uh, Lehman Russ goes off on that could easily result in him being just like, he's been in the war for 10,000 years killing cast space marines. He just comes back one day. Um, and then of course you have the MacGuffin of uh, the the perpetual, uh, which is Vulcan. So Vulcan being the primer that's perpetually can't die. You can kill him an endless amount of times and he can come back. Um, although they may actually, I, I don't. <laughs> though I've, I've not kept up with the Harris, Horse Heresy books enough to know if they've if they've finally killed him. I know that John Chromaticus has lost his immortality at some degree, so we know that the perpetuals can now actually die. But there's some kind of a, there's just a MacGuffin built in there somehow that the Vulcan could come back. The rest of them though, there isn't like a built-in MacGuffin, so. I don't know if that's going to be, you know, a thing that happens, and maybe they just won't. I think, I think that it's 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 valuable to keep them as mysterious as possible for all the reasons I said beforehand. Um, and and as I said earlier, in any kind of creative hobby, the Swiss cheese is actually the things that have value because you just want to get people inspired enough that they go off and start filling it in. They 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 buy boxes of Space Marines and they make their own Space Marine chapter. Or they make their own story or whatever it is. Uh, and I, I can think of several times in my own hobby where I've been inspired by a little throwaway piece of fiction. One of my favorite pieces of fiction is about the, um, the Death Spectres in 40K and the Ghoul Stars, the little arm of Necron Stars where the, the, the Necrons are all infected with the Flare Virus and they all think they're still alive and they're just gobbling down chunks of raw meat to, to try and feed themselves. Um, and it's not a huge part of the 40K background, but it's in there and it, it just piques my imagination. Like, imagine this. This this arm of stars where they're just it's infested with insane robots. <laughs> like, that's so cool to me. Um, let's go to our next question. I'm Brian, and so is my wife. Asks <laughs> uh, this hobby is all about itself and people. Why does Games Workshop still hire pure salesmen? Ruin my local store. I don't get it. Um, well, I'll be honest. At the end of the day, uh, I don't know what you mean by pure salesman uh, because having 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 like been to a million Games Workshop stores in the past, Games Workshop employees have to be salespeople because that store doesn't stay open otherwise. You, that store will not stay open to by having a guy stand around the counter and talk to you about your favorite Space Marine chapter forever. Eventually he's gonna have to say, so what are you working on? You know, like what, what did you want to come in today to, to pick up and buy? Nothing gets done, no lights stay on if you just stand around the store and play games. So there, if, if, you, if you are put off by that, my recommendation is play your stores, and play your games at home. It, make friends that play games, build a game table in your house, and go play your games undisturbed at home. Because every time you walk into a games workshop store, my definition of a bad games workshop store is, or any any hobby store is one that I walk into and nobody asks me to buy something. Because the first thought that pops in my head is this store's not gonna be here in five years. <laughs> Like, I, I don't want to walk into a store and get no service. And that's typically, I think for some people, what puts them off is someone tries to engage them in a sales conversation. Now, pure salesman, hard salesman, cart, like the car salesman sell, like, hey man, that's what are you doing today? What are you, what are you buying? What are you picking up? Like, that's, that's not the right way to do it either. And I've actually never, I don't think, been in a hobby store where anyone's ever done that to me, including games workshop stores. Um, because typically, that's... A, it's very rare you find someone with the balls to do that, <laughs> and and that's not an easy that's like that's not an easy thing to find. I think it's a trope, and you might feel like that's gonna come at you at some point just by having someone say hi to you, but I've never actually seen it happen. Um, I think the best the best uh, hobby stores I've been in general, not just games workshop stores. Um, have salespeople that sell you what you want, right? They what they do is they actually they talk to you. They'll talk to you about your hobby. They'll talk to you about what you're working on, what you're doing, um, and then they'll just try and help you out. Because typically, when you talk about your hobby with somebody, 
something is going to, whatever the next thing is that's on your brain or whatever even made you go and walk into that store is going to come up in conversation at some point. And there might be something that you don't know you need um, that, that's in that shop that they can help you out with. And whether it's just as casually as saying like, oh, cool, did you, you know, like you're working on this big army project for tanks, for Australian tanks. Um, have you tried the air paints because it'll really speed up, you know, paint your tanks or have you tried X or Y through an airbrush? Have you tried the spray gun even just for base coating things? That is a sales conversation and that's okay. Because <laughs> what that is, is that guy listened to you and went, oh, I got something here that might help that guy out and then offered it to you. And that's that's the kind of sales conversation that I think shows a good hobby store. Right? That, that's, a, that's a hobby store where the guy you're talking to is listening to you. But if you don't want anyone to talk to you in a hobby store, then that's okay too. But I don't think that's people being salesmen. -y. That's just you don't want people to talk to you in a hobby store. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's 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 very interesting because I've not ever encountered Games Workshop hiring pure salesmen, mostly because I don't think it's possible to hire pure salesmen for the most part. Uh, unless unless you're watching like Boiler Room and you're seeing these guys in the '80s setting the phone selling like junk junk bonds, and junk stocks. I've never seen those people in real life and I've been to a lot of hobby stores and I've hired a lot of people. <laughs> uh, and for the most part, people with those kind of brass tacks, they're not working in the gaming industry. They're working somewhere else where they can make $10,000 commissions, right? Like they're, they're working on Wall Street or they're walking somewhere where the fact that they can fast talk and they can bamboozle people into buying whatever um, is gonna get them way, way, way more paid than working in a hobby store ever gonna do. So that's my two cents. Um, and yeah, and my advice is if that's not what you want, if, if, if it's happening when you're playing games, you, you wanna go to a store to hang out, one, don't go to a store to hang out. Stores don't exist for people to hang out in. <laughs> if they have a game and I go play a game, they're awesome. But like, it's still a store. Like expect that at some point, someone's gonna talk to you about you know what you're working on and what you wanna get next, because that guy's gotta pay the power bill still. <laughs> And don't be put off like that. If that's the only, if that's the tax you have to pay to have a free gaming space, then pay that tax. And if it's what you don't like, then like I said, just get a game table, play at home. Because that way you've got the peace and quiet that you want in your game. Uh, next up, we got Mike Grimshaw asking, halflings round a sandwich with their pockets full of bells. I just wanted to hear you say that. Thank you. You're welcome, Mike. <laughs> Next up, <laughs> Miles B says, can you comment on the recent trend of games um, down in by, done in by struggling Kickstarters being picked up by publishing stables like Firestone Universe to Wayland, Carnival, Hawk War Games, TD Combat? Um, well, I, I can comment on it. I mean, I don't, I don't know what's happened in any one of those cases, except that they've gotten, new, those companies have gotten to a place, it's probably gotten to a place where they no longer feel like they can be solvent and what they're looking to do is sell their interest onto someone that can make it solvent. Um, and from from the sound of things, it's interesting because both those those companies that have been purchased up TD Combat and Wayland, both of them are more warehouse and manufacturing side of the business, and they are the creative side. What they're doing now is they're buying properties to add to their creative stable, and that actually gives me some reassurance because if you can run a warehouse and pack and ship tons of orders. Um, and in the case of CD Combat, manufacture tons of laser cut stuff, that means you got some business sense behind you. That means that you're, you're always checking if you're in the black and if your sales are outweighing your costs first, because you made it this far, right, in that industry. And you got enough liquid capital to go and buy a property. Um, and so I'd say that's probably the defining feature is you've got, I've, there's tons of wordings right now being made by creative types who don't necessarily have a background in business. And so what happens is they, they imagine it's like you're trying to pilot a ship at night. The, the guy who's on the ship and he's piloting at night, who has lots of experience, is using his radar, he's using his people out front to keep watch, he's using his people in the rear to keep watch, there's good communication happening, and they're checking, 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 checking. He's just not holding course no matter what without knowing what's around him and course correcting when he has to. The creative types, they might set course, but never know that there could be an iceberg out there. So they don't send anyone to go look for one. They never know to check the radar because they don't have experience with radar. So they just hold, well, we go north. I'm sure the water's open in front of us, but then these things that they can't see impact them and they have to course course really fast and it might do so much damage to the ship that the ship sinks. They take on too much water, which in this case would be going into the red, debt, hemorrhaging money to somewhere. Um, and they can't recover. And that's sad, but it's just the reality of people's levels of experience and the various aspects of this hobby. And that's why you've heard me say before, 
one of the things that that uh, actually I think it was my last episode. Some of the things that can keep a miniature game from being a hit are actually the really boring details like distro and warehousing and manufacturing costs that you can have the greatest idea ever. It can be a great game from just like a design and a build and an artistic point of view, but it just never quite gets there because of the things that they might not have planned for that seem like boring details and oh, we'll figure them out later, but they might be really important right from the beginning. And that's, and that's a, I think that's a struggle that some game companies go through. And obviously some take on so much water that they end up deciding you know what, it's time for someone else to take the helm of our property and we're gonna sell it on, in the cases you described. No Name asks, who currently makes your favorite Western train for 15 or 28 mil? Um, for 28 mil, so the funny thing with Western train is, it's usually pretty simple, clapboard buildings and stuff. Um, but to look really good, it's all about the little details. And so it takes a lot more work than modern stuff I find does. Because Western scenery tends to be about the colors and little posters on it and the signs and even just the shape of like the 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 decks and like the the little bits and pieces that really set it in that period of like the great expansion across what the old west and i assume we're talking about the american old west here so not western train is in like castles and moats and dark ages stuff um so right now my favorite my absolute favorite and i've having having built and painted some and then collected and assembled some others I would have to say it's definitely the foreground stuff, the pre-painted foreground stuff. I've used a bunch of it in my videos, and it's just great. It has finished interiors, like all these little things that would be so much work to do yourself. Um, they're just done for you, and you just put it together, and it's ready to rock and roll. And I didn't used to be a huge fan of like pre-done, pre-finished stuff. In fact, gaming mats, when I first saw it, I was like, who's ever going to play on this? But after the amount of experience I've had using it, and just how 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 great the details are and just the the leveling up i think of people's capability to make this stuff and make it look beautiful the foreground stuff is great and it might seem a little spendier than certain other mdf companies because if you're buying it unpainted and still on the on the frame it's going to be cheaper they've put a lot of work into it um but the quality of their stuff is fantastic i'm super super into it that would be my my, my big go-to for 28 mil 15 mil i'll be honest i don't i've never played 15 mil uh, western train so i'm not familiar with any manufacturers to make that stuff so let's jump over to the chat and see how everybody's doing. Anthony Lee's here. Who else is here? Matt Ligori's here. Oh, uh, who else? Who else? We've got Torben Kasperberg's here. Ben Grand Papa Nurgle's here. And there's 10 people watching, but only a couple people have shouted it and said hi, which means everyone else is listening, playing games, or is currently at work or hiding their phone at work and doesn't have the ability to type, <laughs> would be my guess. So let's just see what everybody else is doing. Uh, Anthony's here. Matt Ligari is saying he's, oh, he's sick. I'm sorry, Matt. So I hope you feel better. Uh, Anthony says, who's wants to take a stab at which primer is going to be next? I have no idea. I'm, I'm going to guess one of the demon ones, maybe, because the demon ones are just easier to do. MacGuffin wise, like I said earlier. Uh, Torben's here. Hey, Ash. There's no gaming clubs in Canada like we have here in Europe. I've always found it odd the great difference in venues for playing war games on both sides of the pond. That's a good question. So, I've actually, I think I feel this one before in a couple. I think I, you know what? It's, I didn't do it in a piece of ash. I've done it in the machine shop, which is a bajillion years ago now at Mini Wargaming. I had a, a, a series that was basically me doing what I do now in my editorials at the beginning of this um, about uh, just a topic that was in my head in Wargaming. And clubs, clubs is one of them. I actually did. Uh, and what's interesting is actually, I think the differences between the popularity of clubs here and there is space is at far less of a premium um, in North America than it is anywhere else. Just square footage, being able to find a place to, to congregate and get together isn't as, as filled in usually as, as it is in Europe. Um, and I find that because the density of populations in small areas in Europe, of course, like there's so many people in, in a, a place the size of basically Newfoundland, smaller than Newfoundland actually, like the UK, you got millions and millions, tens of millions of people living in this space that's smaller than one of our least populated places in Canada. <laughs> um, y y you, I think culturally, just people are more used to sharing space. Whereas in North America, we just all want our own space. Like, I mean, you're not you're coming to play in my shed, <laughs> right? Which I think is actually an impediment for us. We're less used to congregating and getting together to do things. Um, and even our, we, we have less access, therefore, to places that share their space, church basements, um, community rooms, stuff like that. It costs a lot of money because let me tell you right now, as a guy who runs tournaments for various games, to find a venue that'll just host 20 people to all be around gaming tables, not even big gaming tables, like four by four gaming tables, cost me four or five hundred dollars Canadian. So, you know, 200 to 300 pounds um, for a day, for eight hours basically to rent that space. Whereas you can find lots of share space venues. 
um, in Europe and the UK that will not cost you nearly that amount of money to do the same thing, just because it's more common that people do it to get together. Um, so they have to charge more here because people just don't do it as much. I think that's really it, and it's a bit sad because I do think you find that 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 like pl pay where you play, a reliance on your friendly local gaming store, people being mad at their friendly local gaming store, liking or just feeling reliant on it to be a very North American issue because people tend to, to, to have that as their only place they play. They don't play at home, they don't invite people over to play in their homes, um, and so they're stuck basically with what they've got. Right, they've it's, it's this or it's nothing. We're gonna you're either play in my store, um, I'm out front, friendly, friendly local gaming store, and hope that that's okay, or I don't play at all. And there is no gaming club because the store wants all our business, so we just go to the gaming store. Some stores do things like try and run gaming clubs or advertise they have a gaming club, or usually it's code for this is the night you come in to play X game. Our club meets on blah blah blah. But there's no membership or dues, it's not formalized like a gaming club might be in the UK or Europe, where there's like you know, there's a treasurer and there's like a charter and people pay dues because they have to pay for the location they can keep stuff there and you know there's train and tables and stuff so it's a bit different of a it's a bit different of a process and so yeah it's strange but i think it's just a cultural byproduct of of a, a culture cultural sorry a culture and space that's more used to and even dependent upon sharing space and 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 being together and doing things together because space is at a premium versus over here a more <laughs> I don't want to say hermit-like, but there's so many people here and you don't actually interact with them very much because we have so much space. There, there's, there's less shoulder to shoulder, I think, rubbing together. You know, we don't have our, we don't have our laundry in our kitchen <laughs> just because there's physically more space to live in um, than, than there is necessarily in the, in the, the sort of like, you know, longer colonized area. You have to understand Europe and the UK has been colonized for far longer than North America is with the density that it is. Obviously, there's, you know, the native peoples in North America have been here for far longer than anyone else. As long as there's been people, they've been here. But that density of population that ha that came about when, when you know, the, the colonial era happened in North America is a blip compared to the history of Europe and, and, um, and the, sort of the dense, the dense history, the dense populated history, and the, I guess the term would be the urban history. So like people congregating and living in cities um, has been happening for thousands of years in, in the UK and Europe. So it's just people are more used to sharing space than they are here. Whereas there's just tons of space here and we're all very insular for some weird reason because we don't rub up against people as much. Um, what else we got? Matt Ligori says, yeah, he actually, uh, Matt Ligori actually gave almost the same answer I did. He said, here in the US, it's still very game store focused and also, also places that are also comic book shops. I've seen one gaming club open in New York City, but that's it. I hope it starts to catch on though. I do too. I think what's great is 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 that, that spirit of independent gaming. Um, one of the things I love about about gaming clubs in the UK and um, and Europe is they tend to play everything. They're not they're not focused around a game necessarily, uh, and you can go and actually see and try little interesting games. And a lot of the games that I've I've played in the past that are, you know, these little sort of like independent games, have spawned out of the local gaming clubs. Out of the gaming club getting together and saying like, hey, we have these cool miniatures. I'd love to play a blah kind of game. And one of them writes it, and then they publish it, and then away you go. We've got neat things to do. Anthony says, I'm the president of a gaming club near Boston. We've got relatively unique uh, arrangement with our store. We do all the social media networking and they provide a place for us to play. There you go. So there's, there's an example of a good gaming club um, sort of like symbiosis with a gaming store where they've been given a venue and then they get to do some some sort of like propagating and and, um, and uh, whatchamacallit and uh, organizational stuff. And he says, we've got officers, a treasurer, and our members pay dues to help support our website and buy commercial resources like train and fat mats. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, and then Grand Papa Nerd was saying, an opinion on tourney organizers playing in their own tournament and winning prizes. Uh, so that is an interesting topic because I actually had to do that this past weekend. Um, and I've done it in the past too. Um, as a tournament organizer, the, the thing that I hate the most in tournaments is anyone not getting to play a game. Um, I think if you come to a tournament, especially if you pay to play in it, then the number one thing should be you get to play every game. Um, and so what, what I always do is I bring an army to a tournament, typically not a very good army. Um, I try my best to use just like starter set armies if there are them. Uh, for Infinity lately, what I've been doing is playing with the 300 point army boxes because they're pre-constructed. I can, I can just kind of like disavow how good or bad they are. <laughs> um, and I know I'm giving a, an honest play experience to my opponents and just play through. Now it has happened a couple times that I've actually placed or actually won in the tournaments that I've had to run. Run. but if that happens I do not actually claim the prizes I would always give it to the guy who comes second um, 
and that's that's sometimes just been unavoidable. So I, I wouldn't actually win the tournament if there's like a ranking or stuff like that. I would always give it to the next person down, um, and they would be the official the official winner. So no matter where I place, I don't place. I don't get any prizes. I don't get anything. Uh, I would never take home something that that was meant to be for the people that you know paid and showed up and did stuff. Um, I think that's really important because as the tournament organizer, your responsibility is to give a great play experience to your opponents, or uh, to your to your participants, not to um, take that stuff home yourself. And so, uh, I think that's a really like a really key philosophical thing. Now, some people might disagree with me and say like, "Hey, he played; he's just as eligible for that stuff as anybody else." But as the CEO, what I really want is I want people to come back and play my tournaments again. <laughs> If I'm running a great, it's like throwing a party. People, have, you, you know, you, you, some people say like you throw a party, don't drink at your own party. Well, I think it's okay. <laughs> don't be the guy with the lampshade on his head. <laughs> you know, like maybe you don't have the most fun at your party um, because you want people to come back to your party and have a good time too. So it's an important balance, I think, between um, making sure that you, you do an honest sort of like showing because you don't want to give anybody the tournament either. Like you, if you just let yourself get squashed every single game. Um, or if you just like tub thumb everybody every single game, that's uneven too. So you know, make some sort of like provisions for what happens if you have to play, but then never be in the running for actual like any actual prize or support and stuff like that. Because I think that's just that's you missing the point of running a tournament. You didn't run a tournament so you could play it. You ran a tournament so people could have a good time and they could they could enjoy playing the tournament. And if you want them to come back and do it again, make sure they have a good time. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think that's I think that's an important thing. Who's next? Torben Kasperg says, not sort of flame war, but why do you suspect that the campaign rules for AOS are so shallow as they are, rather than the deep, immersive experience of yesteryear? Um, I don't know. Uh, I actually haven't looked at them, so I can't comment. Um, if you're talking about compared to like the campaign for End Times, I wouldn't have actually called the End Times like a campaign. The End Times was almost like a new, a, a like subset of an addition because it changed core rules. It created new armies. Like it was a, you know, pull out all the stops. Let's send off this edition. Let's send off the old world of bang. Let's spend a ton of money on like book development and model development and all this stuff versus like a slim campaign book that's just meant to like cover a three month campaign. Those are kind of two different entities. <laughs> um, and. It, it looked to me like the, I can't remember what it's even called. I haven't looked at the AOS campaign. I've been too obsessed with Path to Glory. It's like Flame something, Flame Dealy. I don't know, I'm not playing it, so I don't know. Um, but it doesn't seem like it's any bigger or smaller than campaign expansions like, I don't know, the I Terra campaign or uh, what was it, Storm of Chaos for Fantasy in the past or anything like that, which were just single books. And they might give you some variant army lists and scenarios to play and stuff like that, or like some special siege rules or something, but like, they didn't, it wasn't huge. It was meant to run for like three or four months, give people a fun, different way of playing the game and then be over. So I don't know, that's my very superficial answer because I don't, I don't know enough about it really to give you guys an in-depth answer. But from the size of it, it seems like it's, it's about on par with what's been done before. But I, I think if you ever compare anything to like the Storm of Chaos campaign, it's like comparing apples to ducks because <laughs> Like, <laughs> they're not, they're not even close to the same thing. That was a, that was like a four alarm. Let's just, let's just throw all the money at saying goodbye to Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Um, sort of like a thing. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, what else we got here? Mm, Dave Taylor says, you're absolutely spot on. I hope you're talking about the TO thing. That's my jam for the TO thing. Cause I mean, the, I, I always get excited when I get to play my own events. I don't really want to, I don't want to win the games, but I still want to play the games. You know what I mean? Um, and and yeah, and I, I think people having a good time is super important. So I hope that's, I, it's actually been too, too, too recently I've done that in. I actually played in because we had a whole bunch of drops. And it's usually for the worst reason people just can't show up. Um, and a whole bunch of drops for the Dark Age tournament I ran at the Geekery. And we had a whole bunch of drops for this last Infinity tournament. Just to end up being an uneven number, right? And I don't want anyone to, sh to drive a, a huge amount of distance and then sit out a game. Um, that's really it. Oh yeah, Dave Taylor's here next. He just said something. <laughs> uh, what else we got? Torben says, oh, I was thinking of more about the Path of Glory rules actually compared to those from 6th and 7th edition. I don't know what you compare the Path of Glory rules to though, because the original Path to Glory, if you're comparing it to that, was just, uh, it was only for Chaos War bands. Like it was literally only for the four Chaos Gods and that was it. Like there was nothing, there was, there was no rules for any other armies. So the current Path to Glory War bands are like, a hundred pages more rules than the original one, which was a four page book that I used to give people for free when they started fantasy in our stores. Um, yeah, so I don't know. 
I don't know. And then uh, Turbin says, anyone else excited for Kings of War Vanguard? I am. I actually get to have a look at it, and it looks really cool. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, it looks really cool. It looks really neat. It's got some, it's got some interesting, some interesting stuff going on. It's a little bit, um, Company of Irony. That's what it feels like to me. It's got that Company of Iron kind of like vibe where you're you're very immersed in it because you're always doing something. You're going back and forth with your opponent, always doing something, which I really liked. Love Company of Iron right now. It's so any game that kind of like feeds into that. It's funny. We've had a lot of games that are kind of in the same vein start to come out with each other. So like Shade Spars come out and Aristides come out and they're kind of in the same vein. And now we've got Company of Iron coming out and Vanguard coming out. And again, they're kind of like not the same necessarily from a design point of view. But they're hitting the same chords, you know what I mean? The intent of like what they're designed to do, pull people sort of like from, from the, the way out combat, like you're, you're watching a large battlefield and then dial it into like more close quarters action. And the same thing with Shade Spire and, um, and uh, uh, what should we call it, Aristide, where you have this like arena style game with team building. And it almost feels like a MOBA style thing, right? Where you're, you're fighting teams against teams and characters against characters. Uh, what else we got here? Daniel Sprinkle asks, do you play, have you ever played historical games like Bolt Action, Hail Caesar, or Napoleonic? I have played all three of those things um, in the past. I played a lot of World War I. Um, I loved Warhammer Historical's um, The Great War. Uh, it's a fantastic variation of old 40K rules, fourth edition 40K rules, and it's really well done. Um, I've played Flames of War, tons of Flames of War, actually, I've still got my mid-war Germans. Uh, Chris from Wizard Games and Hobbies is campaigning hard right now to come in and do a Flames of War set. Um, he wants, he's gonna paint both armies and just come in, he wants to show off the new edition of the game because he really loves it. Um, and Bolt Action, I have a bunch of stuff for, but I'm much more likely, just because of the way my brain works, I'm much more likely to play Conflict 47 because it's got robots and zombies in it. <laughs> but, but you can always just play Conflict 47 without any of the super science stuff and just have your World War II at the same time. But I like my World War II um, with like a little Hellboy, you know, like a little dimensional gate and craziness in it because that's just, that's how I roll. It gets too dry otherwise. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not a history guy. Like I love history, but I'm not a history guy to, to, to try and create, recreate something that actually exists isn't my, it's not in my sort of like bailiwick. It's, I love to paint my own vision of stuff, you know what I mean? And so be able to play around like a, a science fiction or reimagine or alternate history thing is just more my, more my jam. I played lots of Gear Krieg too, which was the World War II version of Heavy Gear, which was super cool. Uh, there was a brief period where they were gonna release 28 mil Gear Krieg miniatures too, and I was so excited about it. They, they made the Valkyrie, which was one of the German walkers. Um, and I collected a bunch of miles for it, and then it just didn't happen. <laughs> um, actually, uh, a really cool game designer named Agus did uh, the Gear Krieg. It was based on, oh shoot, Battlefield Evolution's rules, which is a Mongoose rule set. Um, and it was a Gear Krieg 28 mil game. And I can't remember if it was called just Gear Krieg 28 mil or if it was called something else. But it was it was super cool. I saw that rule set too, which was really nice. Um, I've not, I've, I've played, what was the other one? Fields of Glory? Not Hail Caesar. It's the, the precursor to that, which was Fields of Glory, I think was the version I played. Um, and then I've played some Six Mill Napoleonics, but they, I never played them with my armies. It was the club I used to go to. Was a, They had a huge Napoleonic like the, the set. There was a bunch of guys who loved Napoleonics. They always played it in Six Mill because you can only play Waterloo if you play it with every single miniature. And so like the, the Six Mill Waterloo is impressive because you're talking about planting like tens of thousands of six millimeter soldiers and luckily six millimeters is, is epic scale like it's super tiny um so you can get away with it but like it was it's when you do that it's super impressive because some of the napoleonic rules that we used had like a fog of war mechanic too where like you couldn't talk to each other so like there was the general and he could talk to his immediate staff and they could talk but then you have to write messages like on slips of paper and then roll to see if they actually got communicated or not. So you put that slip of paper next to like a, a person and if that runner didn't make it over to the battalion that the rules were for, as like a field commander, you just couldn't change your orders. And so we'd have this great time where like for a few hours we're playing a game and literally like three of us are in a group and we're able to talk to each other because we're all like the local field commanders. And then there's six guys in like the field HQ and they can all talk to each other, but we can't hear each other talk. Like we'd have to all talk at different times. It was crazy, it was super cool. Um, Anthony Lee says, how do you even paint uh, six millimeter? Yeah, dry brushing and washes is good. I actually, it's funny because I actually went and highlighted a lot of stuff in my, my epic armies and people used to freak out. <laughs> 
Daniel Sprinkle says, my son's amazed that you just said my name on YouTube. I just said it again. <laughs> and then I have Conflict 47 real book in the mail. Yay, awesome. I'm actually stoked for Conflict 47. The problem, the problem is, of course, with all these games, find people to play it with. I should try and, what I should try and do is on my way to Jordan DeLine, um, who's a local Bolt Action player and his Bolt Action community is really active. He's got a bunch of Bolt Action stuff. I could probably just convince him to try Conflict 47 with me um, and we'll just do some super science elements and whatever. I have this idea in my head for my, my Conflict 47 stuff where I want to do like a Canadian, you know, like like detachment, obviously, because it's Canadian. Um, and to use a bunch of the, the robot stuff, but to have them be different robots, like use different miniatures in the automatics, and have them be the, 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 bell, uh, the bell automaton. So like instead of having mine be the the automatons that are in the rule book, I would use like the heavy infantry rules for like a more advanced automaton and have them be like the bell, the Alexander Graham Bell version. <laughs> Where he's like, the teleautomatics is what I was gonna call them. The Alexander Graham Bell teleautomatics. Cause the idea was the, um, the robots in Conflict 47 are, are self, they're self-driven, so like they do their own thing, but they're very limited in what they can do. Whereas the ones I would have, the Teleautomatics, would be more like, they're robots, but they're actually being moved by, they're, they're, the people are like 10 miles away in a bunker, able to see through the robots, and it's more like a drone is today, and like they're walking around with them. And so I could use robots for the heavy infantry, because I have these dust, or these d d dirt? Rust. Rust? I don't know what they're called anymore. They went away. There's these dog robots that I bought. They were called like dog or something. These robots are fantastic miniatures. And then some company bought them. I think Grindhouse made them. And then some company bought them. And then they didn't ever get released. Like they just disappeared into the ether. But I have I have two packs of them basically. And I've always wanted to paint them. So I should do it. Uh, Dan Springer says, holy cow, six meter water will be amazing. It's like, all, like I've actually seen like three millimeter water really, where they've done like all, all the all hundred plus thousand soldiers on the, on the battlefield at once, which is nuts. Um, Torben says, would you say that 15 mil is harder to film show off on YouTube compared to 28 mil considering the smaller miniatures? I think if you, again, you have to do it right. You know what I mean? It, it's, I'm lucky in that I, I think about the way I film things enough that well, I'm not lucky. I, I just think about the way I film things enough that I try and think what's the best way to portray this game. And that's why you see me change how I portray games based on what they are. Like for instance, the static camera I used in Shade Spire, I would never use in Warhammer Quest. And you've actually seen in the last two weeks, both those things come out. And the reason for that is in Shade Spire, the arena is fixed, but it's also small enough that I can get a good looking shot of it with my camera. Um, and then I've come up with ways now to make that, that shot interesting, where you can still see me and my opponent actually playing our games. I started that mental process when we filmed Gore Chosen, and I think I've got it to a place now where I'm really happy with it. But because of the progressive nature of the dungeons in um, Warhammer Quest, I'll always film with the old Battle Report style because things are moving around, and the table's even moving around and getting bigger too. So I think that's gonna be, that's gonna be the way probably I film Hero Quest as well, it won't be a fixed board we'll get right in there and you know, there's gonna be scenery elements and stuff blocking paths. You're gonna to wanna to actually see up close what's going on. Um, and so it's horses for courses. So I think with 15 mil, as long as your focus is on like the armor and you've got your camera, you know, your, your actual like, camera plan, your camera handling and your in-camera editing right, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a, a, a pretty YouTube video. But I think if you try to film it like a War Machine Battle Report, like a fixed camera up in the air, you don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> like it'd be so hard to do. Um, See, so yeah, I think you could do it, and especially if there's big things in the game, still like armor, um, tanks, because like you're just basically replacing the emphasis. Like if, if you're replacing the emphasis from the the, the 25 mil soldier onto the 20, you know, the some 15 mil tank, so it looks about it's a bit bigger than a 28 mil soldier. It'd be like a small bike or something like that in 40k. Um, I think it's okay. I think the camera dials in and just kind of like it 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 focuses on those things instead. But like I said, it's like anything. You just got to think about how you do it. I think more than anything else. Uh, Daniel says, finding people to play is always a problem, especially in rural North Carolina. The plus side is, I can take my time painting and do a decent job. Well, decent for me. I think that's important too, is, is it, and you're kind of hearkening me back to early days in the hobby where I might only have known, when I was like 16, I probably knew like two or three other people that even knew what Wargaming was. And one of them was my friend's older brother, James, who had no time for this kid. You know what I mean? Like I was a kid, like he wasn't gonna play 40K with me because I was like seven, eight or eight years younger than he was. <laughs> and even though like we discovered Wargaming, I basically discovered Wargaming by watching him play it. I think we played maybe one or two games my entire life at, up to that point because I was the little kid, you know what I mean? Like he was playing 40K with his friends. I probably knew like one or two other people that were into Wargaming would even try Wargaming with me. Um, 
so I think what that happens in that regard is you tend to then focus on the things you can do more, things like painting and building miniatures and stuff like that. And I, I'm pretty sure that a big part of, this is all pre-internet days, like this is like, this is strange, this is Stranger Things days, right? Like this is the, this is the, the mid to late 80s. Um, you just tend to emphasize the things that you can do by yourself more. And that's probably where my, my love of the, the whole, my holistic love of the hobby, right? Like to me, it's not, it's not, I'm not getting it right until it's all painted and there's a nice table and the table is themed to what we're doing and you know, it's, it's all in front of me and I'm seeing this whole thing unfold. Is because of that, is because I, like you said, you have the time to get it right and I think that makes you appreciate the end result more, you know what I mean? And that's why I think I feel, I feel kind of empty. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I feel empty when I see the, the unpainted miniatures get dumped out of a box basically and play on felt circles because like, I'm like, oh no, you're doing it wrong. Like, and I know they're not doing it wrong. Everybody has to do it the way they want to do it. But it, the, the, I had this like gut check reaction of like, oh, please just, just do it, just do it differently. <laughs> and it's not right of me to do that. But at the same time, you can't help how you, how, you know, how you just like emotionally react to something happening in front of you. Dave says that you should totally paint those old grindhouse figs. I'd love to see them. I've got piles of them. I actually have one of the things I was thinking about doing actually for Throwback Thursday because I don't know if it's around anymore is doing incursion. I have all my incursion stuff still and incursion was this great 28 mil world war ii space hulk and it was so much fun i have all the the detroit steel guys painted for it still and i still have piles of the zombies and werewolves and stuff but it's basically space hulk in a secret nazi lab under the rock of gibraltar where zombie gas got out and these guys from the detroit lucky sevens who are this like this like power armored regiment and of course detroit motor city they're building all the power armor for world war ii and this like alternate world war ii are like fighting their way to try and stop like the evil doctrine and doomsday device and it was a super neat game and it never really caught on um like yeah no i just I wish it was. I wish it was. A, I wish it was a thing that was still around. I think, but I still have all of it. And I should actually do it. But the those grindhouse figs are really nice, and there's also um, yeah these random robot figures that that came up with it too. I'll probably actually use the grindhouse figures for my heavy infantry too for Conflict Forty Seven. Uh, Torben says I had to start to get people interested back in the day. So funnily enough, my first war game was actually Void 1.0 from Icor. That was the first. That was one of the first major games. I think I, I think it was in '98 or '99. Void came around. That was the, one of the first games I ever demoed for. I actually became part of their demo team. I wrote away and I said I was interested, and they sent me three Viridian. No, they sent me five actually. A whole box basically of Viridian Marines and a whole box of Syntha. Uh, what are they, Andersons, the basic Android guys. And they were just in like loose and baggies. And they sent me the purple Void 1.0 rollbook. And I actually demoed that game. I went to my local game store. It was the first time I'd ever done it before. I, I didn't work for Games Workshop yet. And I panned them up and I went. I was teaching people how to play Void. And funnily enough, that store picked up Void and then became the distributor of Void before they went under, which is an interesting story as well. Um... I think the Void community moved to Mini Wargaming or something like that. What was the forum's name? I think you're thinking of Mini Mini Forms. Mini Forms was what it was called. It was called Mini Forms, and then it became the Warp.net. I don't remember, but Mini Forms was the forum that like we did all our Void stuff on. The designers were on there. There's a bunch of great great painters on there, and Mini Forms was the first miniature online community. This is like in like '99 or 2000 again that I was a part of. That was kind of like the Lead Adventure form. It was a miniature agnostic. Like we didn't care about what game you played. We just loved miniatures in general. And we'd post about whatever we were excited about. And so it was all, it wasn't 40K based. It was just tons of little strange boutique games and companies. That was where I first learned. I actually, I first started talking to Kev White and Sally White on there. Cause they started posting Kev's like original works and hassle free miniatures kind of kicked off on there. Um, we were painting Keltos figures, which Kevin sculpted all of them. Kevin sculpted all the i stuff too. That was my first exposure after Warzone, I think, um, to Kev White stuff was was the, the the Void stuff. And so he was all over mini farms, which was really neat too. Um, Dave Taylor says, I got everything from the Kickstarter. I used to have all the original stuff, but I donated or auctioned them off for charity. Yeah, I know. They're really cool. The, I think we're talking about the um, the... Grindhouse game stuff, the incursion stuff again. They are super neat. I gotta try and find them all. They're in storage somewhere. I know I know the case that has the little miniatures in it, but it's to find the board game now. <laughs> I'll have to go back into storage and try and find it. But I know it's all somewhere, but it's super neat. Uh, and we're coming up on five minutes to the end because I'm only able to do this. It's funny, my 
this, <laughs> so this thing right here, this is the normal mic I use. Um, for whatever reason, my either one of my kids or someone at, I think probably actually at one of the conventions or tournaments I was at walked off with the micro USB for this and none of the micro USBs I've found since then actually connect it. So either this thing has a proprietary or it's like a 2.0 or 3.0 USB. I gotta figure out another USB cable to make my Nessie Blue mic work. So right now I'm on my, and that was why I'm like a half hour late starting, I'm on my lapel mics, my battery powered ones. Um, and I don't like using them for this because they, they chug through batteries. So use them for like an hour and a half, two hours, they might die. Uh, whereas this is just powered on my computer when it's plugged in, so it's, it's easy. They both sound just as good, so it doesn't really matter usually which one I use. But I was searching desperately for a micro USB connection for Nessie Blue Mic to try and get. I was like, I don't my mic because the audio would be crap, and then I had to go dig out all my stuff. Um, the, uh, the the room you might notice actually the room is done. My wife wallpapered this wall uh, and repainted this whole room. It's a bit brighter in here now, which is actually nice for me to film in. Um, and so that's a bit different, uh, but it's also meant that this room was my, my daughter's birthday party room yesterday. And so you guys can't see it, but there's literally unicorn. Well, I'll just show you something here. My wife made all these unicorn themed things. So we've got like glittery <laughs> unicorn themed things, poofy fly things. There's some giant, I'm gonna show you these. There's some giant balloons. Here, let's see this thing. Whoa, this, this guy right here is pretty big. <laughs> A giant, huge helium uh, unicorn balloon in front of me, and I was like unearthing basically my dining room table to try get all this stuff set up. So we're going a little, we're going a little short there. We're only doing an hour instead of an hour and a half because I do still have to go pick up the girl and make sure the boy has pants on um, to go and do those things. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. That was a good talk. I really enjoyed talking about that stuff um, because it was a. Uh, 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 I think it's an interesting deep thought about game design is how do you how do you properly support your game without getting it too big and then what do you do when it gets that way uh, and then of course we have to talk about things like mini forums and void and all kinds of crazy old stuff too which of course I enjoy doing and then plans for the future so you guys haven't seen um, stuff I have coming up right now is I'm working on re refinishing I've just finished the cleaning and the assembly and all that stuff for my hero quest set so hero quest is coming up real soon I'm working my way through all of the uh, well, through some of, and, and maybe playing with some of the new um, 300 point army boxes for uh, Infinity. I've already done the Toha one and the um, Steel Phalanx one. I'm hoping to get to the Corridor one soon because it's, it's come out and uh, I'm hoping I'll be able to, to, to get my hands on that and paint it up. Uh, we've got all kinds of Path of Glory stuff coming up. My Sylvaneth, we've got more Shadespire coming up. Chris from Woods of War is super excited about Shadespire. Um, and this week is the launch of the Orcs and the Bone I can't ever get to get the sepulchral bone rattler. I, it's the dumbest name. The skeletons. <laughs> the skeletons are coming out soon too. Um, and then I'm super jammed about Aristia. I'm gonna be painting up my first, like I built it myself, four man team of Aristia dudes to play against Dylan with. So we got lots of that coming out too. Um, so yeah, so it's gonna be neat. Uh, Malagrace is, well, that's a massive unicorn. Yeah, no, it's literally filling like a quarter of the room in the ceiling. It, it almost got demoed by the ceiling fan a little while ago, so it's safely roped off in one side of the, the room right now. But she had a blast. Yesterday was a sweaty, uh, intense four hours of like tons of screaming uh, kindergarten students running through my house, having a great time, tormenting my poor cat. My poor cat was the star of the show. He was hunted through this place like it was the running man. <laughs> um, and then I got, to, I got to hang out with and awkwardly meet all the parents that I normally just see dropping off the kids and picking them up. So we actually got thrust into a social situation. It was weird. It was it was really cool because we all got along really well. But it was a bit like that first day of high school. You don't really know anybody, but you kind of know them like by sight. And you all would jam in new classes together. And you have to kind of meet everybody and find out who you're going to sit with. So we had a we had a great day yesterday as we all like exchanged phone numbers and figured out, oh, our kids like each other. Cool. I'll see you at the next birthday party. <laughs> so it was good too. So anyway, that'll end off this piece of ash. Um, I'll see you guys next week for the live one on YouTube. Big thanks to you guys, the patrons, of course, for um, all that you guys do and making all this possible and hanging out and chatting with me today. Um, I will see uh, the rest of you guys, of course, next week uh, for you guys watching in the future so you can hang out and chat with me as well. Um, I'll put the new mailbag link uh, in the video description when this goes live on uh, on YouTube. So if you guys are watching right now or patrons are watching this in the future before it goes live, uh, you want to get some questions for next week, go jump in and get those in. I'll do them in order that they arrive. Um, and that's really it. So. We'll see you next week for more of a piece of ash. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching. Till then, I'm Ash. I'm working.